Dear ladies and gentlemen, we are most delighted to welcome tonight Marilyn McCauley at Fondation Bayler. Marilyn McCauley is one of the world's leading experts on Picasso's oeuvre. She not only published an impressive number of books and essays on the artist, but also created many important exhibitions over the years. As such, she was also an enormously precious source for the preparation of the exhibition The Young Picasso Blue and Rose Period here at Fondation Bayler, for which she served as a scientific advisor. Thank you very much, dear Marilyn, for all your generous support and for your great input throughout the planning of the exhibition. Marilyn McCauley received her doctorate um, in art history from Yale University. Subsequently, she taught at Princeton University until 1982 when she moved to England. There, she continued to lecture at university, but also worked as a writer and curator. Together with her husband, Michael Reburn, she founded in 1989 Cattle Goose Press in London. Among many other projects, she has been co-author with the late John Richardson of the first two volumes of the seminal A Life of Picasso. Furthermore, she was the curator of the seminal 1997 exhibition Picasso, the Early, Early Years, at the National Gallery in Washington and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Also, as a more recent example, she created, among others, the 2011 exhibition Picasso in Paris, Eating Fire, on view at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam at, and the Museo Picasso in Barcelona. Tonight, Marilyn McCauley is going to talk about Picasso's artistic practice in the blue and rose periods, a discussion of Picasso's studios and models, his choice of materials, the role of drawing, and the practice of recycling canvases during the blue and rose periods. Dear Marilyn, we are indeed very happy that you made time to be at Fondation Bayerlo tonight, and we are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. And thank you very much for the warm reception that my husband, Michael Rayburn, and I have received on our visit, not only from everyone on the staff, but even some of you I've talked to in the exhibition. So thank you very much. I wanted to start by saying that something about how pe people approach the work of Picasso, and particularly this period. Many methods have been used in discussions of Picasso's works of the blue and rose periods. That is from late 1901 to 1906 including biographical and art historical interpretations. And a number of these are clearly the focus of many of the entries in the catalog to the Bayerler exhibition. More often than not, the biographical approach seems to have taken over in exhibitions and writings about Picasso in the last 25 years, frequently naming the figures, especially the women, uh, in a composition takes precedence over other aspects of the work of art. But what I'd like to do today is to take a different approach and consider this body of work in the context of what we know about the artist's working practice. That is where and how he worked, the materials he used, and other factors, including uh, how he worked with models. The paintings themselves tell us much, not only about his practice, but also how he arrived at certain images. Using this approach, it quickly becomes clear that the attitude Picasso had towards his work and towards working uh, in this period laid the foundations for his approach to art throughout his life. Now, I'm not going to ignore firsthand accounts or even Picasso's words, but when I introduce them, they will be from the period in which these works were created and not later art historical or critical interpretations. Um, many of which are not based on fact. So I wanted to start with the moment Picasso first arrived in Paris in 1900. He was 19 years old, he was an aspiring painter, and he came in the company of one of his uh, Barcelona friends, 
uh, who was called Carlos Casagemas. And they stayed for about two months in a studio in Montmartre. They came, as many other young artists did from all over the world, to attend the World Exhibition that was held in Paris in 1900. And the reason, the specific reason Picasso came was that he had a painting in the exhibition, which he'd done in Barcelona, and it was called Last Moments, and the subject was the visit of a priest to a dying woman. And it was accepted for the Spanish section. And I've put on, this painting is gone, but I've put on, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Scanning. <laughs> oh, okay. It's coming. Okay, I'll continue and then I'll show it to you. It's gone, but there are drawings for it and it's quite clear what the subject was. Um, so, from letters that Picasso and Casagema sent back to Barcelona, uh, we know that in, in addition to enjoying the life of the city and especially the company of women, they also hired a model and were working towards an exhibition. So I'm going to wait a minute. <laughs> I know you saw the, there they are. No, then we want to go back. There we are. So these are, um, this is a drawing that was done in Barcelona, which relates to the composition. It was a big canvas that he submitted and it was accepted for, sh for exhibition at the World's Fair in 1900. And you can see, <laughs> Am I doing something? No, okay. Um, that you can see the priest and you can see the dying woman uh, in the little drawing across on the wall. Very kind of late 19th century subject, a kind of illuminated lamp to her right. And this is another drawing. Note that it's signed P. Ruiz Picasso. This is how he signed his, his works in 1900, Pablo Ruiz was his father's last name, Picasso his mother's, and he used that um, up until 1901. And the drawing shows them outside the entrance to the universe of the World Exhibition, and <laughs> the, what, he, what he does is show himself in the company of his Spanish friends and two of the women who had moved into their studio. The one, uh, you can see Picasso here, this figure here, and he's in the company of an artist called Ramon Pichot, this tall figure, Miquel Utrillo, who actually is the father of Maurice Utrillo, and Casagemas. And on an either side are two of the women that moved into uh, the studio with them, probably. Uh, the one on the left, Odette, who had an affair with Picasso, and the one on the right, Germaine, who had an affair with Casagemas. Okay. Now, Picasso, on this first visit, painted and drew places of entertainment and the streets of Paris, much in the spirit of French artists before him that he admired, including Toulouse-Lautrec and Renoir, as well as another foreigner, Van Gogh, and one of the paintings Picasso realized on that first visit on the left is Moulin de la Galette. And this was actually sold on that first visit. So he achieved some success even in the two months he was in Paris in 1900. Um, you can see that the subject of the Moulin de la Galette certainly reflects the atmosphere of the place itself. You get elements of the, the kind of arches. You can see those at the top of the back. Uh, the lights, and the activity of all the people on the dance floor in Picasso's uh, composition. Uh, this is a painting that's at the Guggenheim in New York. Well, that's gone there. Um, and I wanted just to show, for example, how Picasso starts looking the minute he arrives in Paris at French art. And a painting such as this by Toulouse-Lautrec of the same place. Uh, show some of the same characteristics, particularly that nice view at the corner where you get the tabletop bringing you, the spectator, into the scene close to uh, these women who are highly made up uh, in the foreground. Now, Picasso returned to Spain after spending two months in Paris, but he was back again in the spring of 1901. 
And he immediately set about preparing for another, for an important exhibition, his first major exhibition in Paris at the Gallery Vola. And it was planned to open in June. He arrived in the spring. And it was planned to include more than 60 works. Now, the vast majority of these were executed in a new studio he now occupied at the foot of Montmartre on the Boulevard de Clichy. And he shared the top floor apartment of the building with a kind of small time Barcelona, well, originally from Barcelona, art dealer called Pere Magnac. But Pere Magnac was important to him because Pere Magnac was kind of working in Paris. He wasn't a major dealer, but he was arranging, especially for young Spanish artists who were arriving for around 1900, arranging for exhibitions of their work. And he saw the potential in Picasso, and he helped organize the Volar exhibition. Now, there aren't a lot of uh, sort of documents like the one on the left, which is an, a photograph which was taken in uh, 1901 in that studio on Boulevard de Clichy. And you can see in the photograph Picasso seated. He has a palette in his hand and a brush. Uh, Magnac is standing on the right of Picasso, and then another Barcelona painter and his wife are at the left. There's certain things that I find in terms of Picasso's practice, that is, how he worked, how he liked to keep his paints uh, using an easel and so forth, that you can find in this, ex in this photograph. Uh, notice that he keeps a, a, a box of paints on the floor. There's another easel on top of it. Um, the work on the principal, I mean, I'm sorry, a palette on, on top of the paints. And on the easel is a painting they're looking at, but there's also one on the back. We can't tell what it is, but it looks like he's painted both sides of the canvas. Down in the foreground is a little composition which does still exist, and it's thought to be a portrait of Volard. Now, um, another thing that in studying this picture um, that I've been interested in is I wanted to know, some people said Picasso liked to paint at night. But he had to, at this period, but he had to have enough light. To, he had gas lamps in his, his apartment, to, but to prepare for this show. And there was a source of, a, an important source of natural light. And that's a window at the left, where it's kind of angled. And it's reflected in a mirror on the right. So that we know he had plenty of natural light in addition to the gas lights he would have used at night. Now, one of his friends from Barcelona who came to Paris later in the year, that is, Picasso arrived in around April, and his friend uh, Jaime Sabartes arrived uh, in the autumn. Um, he has left us a good description of how Picasso worked. He said, as a rule, the palette was on the floor, as one of them is here, White, heaped in the center, constituted the basis of that type of mixture, which he prepared especially with blue. I do not recall ever having seen Picasso holding the palette in his hand. He assures me that sometimes he does, just like everyone else. It may be so, but I've always seen him preparing his colors by leaning over a table, a chair, or on the floor. So I, I suspect that sitting there with his palette and a brush is partly a pose for the photograph. Now, among the largest works in the 1901 show, which opened in June of 1901, was Picasso's confidently painted self-portrait. And it's an oil on canvas. And I think it was intended as a kind of pictorial announcement of his arrival on the Paris art scene. And he now has abbreviated his name. It's no longer P. Ruiz Picasso, but simply Picasso. Why I think this is an announcement is above that he puts yo, me. This is me, Picasso. Um, the way in which it's painted is also very different from the moody uh, kind of uh, dark palette that we associate with his Barcelona years. And this, I think, is done in response to the French art that he discovered. One of the nice things about this is the representation of the palette. Um, this area is the artist's palette. Notice that all those colors are kind of uh, marked on it kind of energetically. And they're the same colors that he used for his face, the scarf around his neck, little highlights on that thick white paint. Uh, you'll see it better upstairs. Um, now, 
In preparation for the Volar show, Picasso worked quickly, completing, as it was reported in the press, up to three or four compositions a day. As far as his materials were concerned, he worked principally in oils, and his supplier was a nearby color merchant in Montmartre called Léon Bénard. Unlike Georges Braque, for example, who prepared his own paints from pigments, Picasso preferred to buy his paints in tubes. Um, and later, and this is something I've studied in, other, in another context, he also liked to, to buy non-artist paints in cans, and sometimes you see photographs with a can on the table. The fact that some of the paintings in the Volar show are credited to the collection of Madame Bénard indicates, I think, that he may have exchanged some works with Bénard for paint supplies. Now, while some of the oil paintings for the Volar show, such as Yo Picasso, were done on canvas, many others were done on cardboard. Given that he was working at speed, and that he, he had very few financial resources. I mean, Magnac gave him a little bit of money each month, um, but that probably went towards his rent. Cardboard uh, would offer a much cheaper alternative. Uh, one of these, which is in the show here, is on the left, Au Moulin Rouge, and I'm showing it with a photograph of the place itself. Now, in general, with the cardboard, he applied the paint directly onto the cardboard. That is, he didn't prepare the surface of the cardboard as he would have had uh, the canvases prepared. And he not only recorded his imagery quickly, but he did it very directly. There aren't a lot of changes um, on the cardboard that are visible. If he made any preliminary works, that is, drawing out what he was going to paint, they would have been simply done with uh, dark paint, or perhaps even charcoal. Um, in the, the Moulin Rouge scene at the left, I mean, there are really obvious connections to the painting techniques that he might have observed in paintings, for example, by Van Gogh. Uh, note especially in her hat this kind of difference of vibrant colors and brushwork. And the scene of the dancers below on the dance floor is reminiscent of Toulouse-Lautrec's posters of those black stocking figures, dancers, and they add to the rhythm of the scene on the dance floor. And here's a photograph showing something of what you would have seen, the dancers in the middle surrounded by uh, the people who were there. But this also indicates that Picasso's view was above them from a higher level. Now, shortly after the Volar show closed in late June, a Catalan musician, some of you who know about music might have heard of Ricardo Vignes, a pianist. He was a Paris resident, and he wrote in his diary that Picasso had come to him to ask for financial help. And the pianist loaned him money in exchange for the promise of three works, which the artist gave him the following year. And one of these is a painting in the show here, which is called uh, Woman with a Jeweled Collar, or Le Terre, the courtesan. And although it was painted after the Volar show closed, it didn't enter Vignes' collection for another year. Now, a shift in mood, as well as in form and the way it's painted, characterizes Picasso's paintings after the Volar show. In addition to this kind of strong kind of enclosing outline um, and the simplification of the features of the sitter, a new mood, uh, somewhat more isolated, is suggested by the way in which the painting was composed. Um, we were looking this morning at the works again in the exhibition and noted that there are certain formal developments that you can see happening once he starts to simplify and kind of contain his figures, even in the facial figures like her nose. It becomes more of a kind of regular shape. Now another work in the show is the one on the left, which is called La Gomeuse. Um, in this work, um, the, um, the title um, probably was, um, Picasso never gave titles to his work, so that came later. I'll come to that in a second. 
This is another post volar exhibition painting. And this nude is placed very close to the front of the canvas in the foreground. And she's, again, enclosed with a kind of strong outline um, it, to emphasize her self-containment within the composition. But that contrasts with the way the brushwork is done in that scene above her, um, which suggests something like a dancing figure. Um, but all we see are those red stockings and that kind of flimsy outfit of the lower part of the woman's body. Interestingly, the flower that this figure wears in her hair could either be a flower in her hair or part of that, that uh, painting in the background. But the fact that we get a painting in the background probably suggests it was done at Picasso's studio, uh, which then suggests that maybe this was a model, that maybe she was an actual person. Um, it also reminds me of the way Gauguin, for example, whom he uh, was looking at very closely, uh, painted similar scenes, a figure a kind of flattened, in this case, a kind of flattened figure set against a kind of um, decorated background, um, which focuses in on her, but gives a context to the whole. Now, as I say, Picasso rarely, if ever, gave titles to his works. And in this case, the title La Gomeuse may well have been given to the composition when it was first exhibited. And the woman portrayed could actually have been an entertainer. Because around 1900, the word gomeuse was popularly associated with sexily or sexily dressed or almost undressed uh, cafe concert singers and their songs. Uh, we know that in 1901, in order to earn a little bit of money, Picasso uh, drew a number of such performers, including the celebrated singer Polaire, and uh, these were published in the Paris journal Fru Fru. Uh, the drawings came out between February and September of 1901. Polaire is easily identified by her wavy black hair and very diminutive features. And she often wore plunging necklines and even patterned scarves around her neck. And she may have been the model, or she may have you know, been at least the inspiration for the figure in this uh, painting on the left. Around the turn of the century, when Polaire was performing in Paris, she was referred to as La Gomeur's Epileptique because of the way her body shook as she shifted her feet from one side to the other during her songs. Th something special about this painting is that up until recently, no one's been able to see it. So that uh, having the opportunity to see it here at the Byler is, is a, a great pleasure for everyone, including me. Now, on the other side of this canvas, is a caricature of Magnac, that dealer that helped Picasso with his first show. Now, it has an inscription. It says at the bottom, Recuerdo a Magnac en el día de su santo. So that suggests that it was given to Magnac as a gift on his saint's day, which is the 29th of June, presumably when the canvas was finished. Now, although Magnac had played a role in finding buyers and arranging that show for Picasso in the early uh, months of his visits. They subsequently argued and broke off contact when Picasso left the Boulevard Cliché studio in January 1902. <clears throat> so he basically disappears from Picasso's life. It's a crazy picture, but it's on the back, and one has to use that as evidence for, for dating the work. Now, really moving on to the blue period. Now, the term blue period originated with a critic in 1914 called Gustav Kokio, who was the first to divide up Picasso's early work into periods. Now, whether or not this was helpful uh, is debatable, but the division into periods in his early work has have struck ever since. Picasso himself much later said that it was thinking about the death of his friend Casagemas, the person he came to Paris with that first time, who'd committed suicide in Paris over a failed love affair in February 1901, while Picasso was in Madrid, so he wasn't there. 
uh, Heath said thinking about it, had started him painting in blue. And several canvases done beginning in the late summer into the autumn of 1901 were devoted to the memory of his friend. Now, Picasso wasn't present at his friend's funeral, but Casajemas in a Coffin, which is another work painted on cardboard, at least serves as a posthumous commemoration of Casajemas with his recognizable profile. And it should be stated that Picasso had a phenomenal visual memory, so he didn't need somebody to be sitting in front of him or a photograph to work from. He could create their features um, when he painted Casajemas or other friends and lovers when he wanted to. Here, the dominance of the color blue contrasts, and you'll see this more in the painting, uh, the yellowish white of the skin. And I feel that kind of serves to emphasize the coldness and silence of death. Recent technical studies of this painting have revealed that there's another composition under Casajemas, a still life composition featuring flowers in a vase. And there were several flower still life paintings sold at the Volar exhibition. And Picasso's decision to paint over this one uh, probably was motivated by two reasons. One, he needed something to paint on. He needed a support. And two, he was no longer interested in flower compositions that he'd done earlier in the summer. When Picasso's friend Sabartes arrived in Paris from Barcelona in the autumn, he recorded his impressions of going to Picasso's studio, studio, and he remembered that evocation, which is also known as the burial of Casajemas, was standing in Picasso's room. He said, the first thing one saw on entering Picasso's studio was the big picture, the burial of Casajemas, which hung, I know not how or by what means, slightly away from the wall, as if it were a screen used to conceal something which it were better not to leave in sight. Now, it's an interesting composition in that it, it's divided into a kind of earthly zone below. And you see the dead Casajemas, although faceless, in white, surrounded by a group of typically blue period mourners. Uh, in the middle section, another blue period mother and child serves as a kind of intermediary with prostitutes uh, at the left, children in the center, and two nudes at the right. And then the departing soul of Casajemus uh, is on the white horse, symbolically, uh, being kissed by one of the nudes. Uh, what's nice about the way this is painted is that the division of it into these different realms and the breaking up of the clouds and the, the kind of tonality, the way in which light is suggested by the whites on the blues is very <coughs> reminiscent of El Greco. Now, the other principal source of inspiration for the change in subject matter that we come to associate with the blue period, from dancing girls, even models like Polaire, to melancholy women, often with children, was Picasso's visit in the autumn of 1901 to the San Lazar women's prison. The invitation was extended to him by a certain Dr. Julien. And the circumstances of all of this are given by Michael Rayburn in the catalog to the Byler show. Uh, apparently, Picasso was taken into the prison where he could observe the, the prisoners, and he was considered part of the medical team so that they didn't pay too much attention to him. He didn't actually paint in the prison. But again, that visual memory was quite accurate, and he would come back to his studio where he did some drawings and some really uh, fabulous blue period compositions. Um, Sabartes described this particular painting in his memoir shortly after um, he had arrived. He said he was writing an article about Picasso's blue period. He was so struck with the change in the artist's work. He said, I refer to the bluish whiteness of a moonbeam slanting through the window in the picture, representing a woman seated in a prison cell, cell, crouched beneath the caress of pale light which comes to visit her, making her shrunken shoulders still chillier in appearance. What I find interesting about a painting such as this is that they're really, apart from the cool palette and the light 
and her posture, there aren't any anecdotal details that tell us anything about the prison except that she's isolated. Now, when Picasso returned uh, to Barcelona in early 1902, he continued to focus on uh, marginalized figures, but this time he turned to representing the people he saw living on the street or on the beach, and he also continued uh, to use a predominantly blue, pr pr Prussian blue for preference, palette. Now, this is a painting that's fascinated me ever since I've started working on Picasso. Uh, it's in the Kunstmuseum Bern, and it features a slumped woman seated at a cafe table. It was done in Barcelona. Um, her body is typically of the blue period, covered by that blue cloak, and the white scarf on her head echoes the sort of blue and white of the paint on the tabletop and the glass of absinthe, which seems to be empty, on the right. And in this way, her drowsiness uh, can be connected to drink. For this painting, it turns out that Picasso recycled an earlier academic composition um, from the mid-1890s, which he must have found stored in his parents' apartment in Barcelona. An x-ray of this painting shows um, a number of changes beneath the bouvers, as it's known, but a standing male nude, an academic nude, can, can be deciphered. Now, Picasso often recycled canvases uh, such as this during the blue period for a variety of reasons. I've mentioned lack of money, he needed the support, or dissatisfaction with the earlier painting. Uh, X-rays have revealed under a number of blue period compositions, for example, portraits. And uh, there's painting in the Phillips collection in Washington called The Blue Room, shows a nude in the artist's studio. But underneath that is, a, is quite a wonderful portrait, uh, which appears to be a Frenchman, possibly Dr. Louis Julien, who introduced uh, and arranged Picasso to visit Saint-Lazare. Another fascinating uh, aspect of the Kunstmuseum Bern composition uh, is the original shape of the canvas. If you notice that curve that kind of echoes her posture at the left, the upper left, um, it kind of suggests a kind of un unspecified architectural setting. Um, and one finds similar things in drawings done in Barcelona in 1902, around the same time, such as this, which is always considered to be a preliminary drawing for Picasso's famous panel painting called The Two Sisters, a composition that's in Russia. But notice how that curve echoes uh, this, the slumped over figure on the left here. Um, but the curve is even more interesting than that. It turns out that that curve was actually cut from the canvas, so that originally, the canvas had that shape. Um, now, at some point, a piece of canvas was added to make it a, rectangle, a rectangular shape. And as pointed out in the Beiler catalog, uh, this painting was bought by Gertrude Stein in 1906, that is four years after it was done, and photographs of her apartment show it with the added canvas already in place. However, the color of that area in those photographs is dark when she first acquired it. And judging by later photographs, it was repainted some years later, around 1911 or 12. Now, whether or not Picasso carried out the repainting, we don't know. Um, I thought today I would look closely at the signature to see if maybe that would give a clue, but I don't think it does. I think the signature which was added at some point after it was done, um, doesn't tell us if Picasso painted that bit over on the left. Uh, it's something that needs to be considered. Now, I just wanted to mention in terms of the blue period compositions as subjects, um, that his knowledge of Spanish tradition um, had been instilled in him as a child in Malaga, and especially on a visit to the Prado with his father, and later when he was a student in Madrid. He was certainly aware of the generally dark, sometimes almost monochromatic palette of traditional Spanish painting, 
uh, such as the one by Luis de Morales, a late 16th century painting uh, that I show you on the left. And um, the idea of doing a kind of Madonna and child, but in modern terms, such as the one on the right, suggests that he had that kind of tradition uh, in mind. In fact, what I think Picasso wanted to do was to empty some of the traditional paintings of their religious content and create modern day imagery. So that while Morales has that dark background, the kind of long, thin face, those long attenuated fingers, which are, can be seen here, the face of the woman, the long fingers, the kind of dark background. Picasso's maternité is actually uh, a kind of contemporary woman, but it has the power of that old religious image. Now, Picasso's friend remembered, his, sorry, his, Picasso's friend Max Jacob, the poet, French poet, remembered that when he first visited Picasso at the time of the Volar show, Picasso painted Max Jacob with all his books on the floor, and that we have found from x-rays is underneath this image. So again, recycling a canvas, re again, a portrait. Another aspect of the interest, renewed interest in Spanish painting was that one of the highlights in 1902 was a large exhibition of Spanish art in Barcelona at the Palace of Fine Arts, which included El Greco's Thuberans and Catalan Romanesque frescoes. So that in this context, the Barcelona Blue Period, as opposed to the French one, uh, can be seen to embrace fully the spirit of traditional Spanish painting, both in terms of color, the palette, and technique, and of the figures he painted. And one of the works I was looking at this morning, which I didn't bring an image of, but it's in the show, is called The Blind Man's Meal. And this is a traditional kind of Spanish subject. Not only does it refer to the senses, uh, because the blind man is, is uh, gesturing towards some food so that you get sight and touch and taste, but it's also a kind of because he's a street person, it's kind of uh, in the tradition of Spanish beggar philosopher paintings. Uh, so that I think it's, it's a factor in um, how Picasso arrived at some of these images that we associate with the blue period. Here's another example. I know this isn't in the show. It's in the National Gallery in Washington and they don't allow it to travel, this painting. But it's generally called tragedy. I think it's important in terms of not only as a typically blue period subject, um, these kind of isolated figures on the beach, a family, uh, the father, the mother, and the young boy. But notice how the gestures of the boy actually don't have anything specific to say, except that they evoke traditional Spanish painting. In this El Greco, for example, the gestures of St. Francis uh, refer up uh, to this kind of moment of ecstasy, this revelation, whereas that's gone, yet the gestures are quite similar. Now, when Picasso recycled the old canvases, um, the other thing I find interesting, and this is the case with tragedy, is that he didn't cover over what might be underneath it. And what, what's underneath this is a, a bullfight scene. And we know that from x-rays and from different kinds of analyses. Um, instead, he just turned the painting and made it vertical. So that here he is in his studio painting this, this, um, this emotional subject over a bullfight. So that in a way, he was so focused, he didn't even see what was underneath. Um, but you can see a few traces of yellow and red just traces of it on the surface of this composition, suggesting the festivity of the seat beneath it. Now, one of the kind of key works of the blue period, which is in the show here, is uh, a work known as La Vie. Again, Picasso didn't give it the title. Um, and during the early period, uh, Picasso painted a few large compositions. And I think possibly with the intention at least as a young man, of submitting them to official exhibitions. This would have been normal in Barcelona. Um, and in that case, he often worked with drawings as a kind of preliminary to doing paintings. In the case of La Vie, the 
we can see from, art, from drawings that the setting of the picture, although it has that kind of arch again that we saw in uh, that uh, woman at a cafe table, uh, is the artist's studio. And in this drawing, it's Picasso himself who's represented, uh, his model draped on his shoulder, and he's pointing in front of, at least, a canvas that's on an easel behind him. Now, while he was working, he changed the face of the figure in that painting to a, a final portrait of his friend Casajemas. Now, I wanted to point that out, not so much that I'm naming the person in the picture, is that why Picasso did this has led more recent critics to come up with all kinds of stories. And one of them is, is that Picasso felt such guilt over his friend's suicide. And in, in order to support a, an interpretation, this, this is a painting about guilt, um, the female figure on the left has been identified as Germaine Gargallo, the woman that Casajemus killed himself over, he had a failed love affair with. And much, much later, because of a little drawing, it was discovered that Picasso had actually had a brief affair with her several months after the suicide. And that's led to this story that the painting is about guilt, um, which I think is, is not necessarily the whole story. Now, I mentioned uh, in, that, in my first image that little drawing for Last Moments, the painting that Picasso submitted to the Universal Exhibition in 1900. When I first started teaching, I did a Picasso seminar, of course, and one of my students was interested in this part of the painting. And when you look at the painting in the exhibition, you'll see that there's a kind of, it's, it's underneath this image, but it, you can see it. There's a kind of bird, there's a wing, there's a kind of bird-like wing, uh, and there's a the bottom of another figure, kind of a, a nude with her, her knees up, which you can actually see on the surface. And he said he wanted to, to study these underpaintings. So I said, well, why don't we write a letter to the Cleveland Art Museum, where this painting is located, and ask them to x-ray it for us? And they did. And so we confirmed the, that there were these uh, kind of changes that were made in the lower part of the composition. But I turned that x-ray on its side, and what I discovered is the painting, if you notice the, oops, is the lamp. And one, if you can, you know, it's hard to look at an x-ray, but you can make out at least parts of the bed and the standing priest in last moments. So what Picasso did was take that, I mean, it was an important painting for Picasso in that it was accepted at the World Exhibition, and it, but it was painted in the studio that he had shared with Casa Jamis in 1900. Um, so that um, the idea of painting his friend once more as a kind of final tribute, I think can be linked uh, to his friendship with Casa Jamis, uh, with whom he traveled to Paris to see that painting in situ. Um, after the canvas had been shown in Paris, it was sent back to Barcelona, and it was probably kept by Picasso's father. And when he needed to work on a large canvas in 1903, he decided to paint over this one, again, turning it vertically. And what he did was paint uh, an allegorical subject about life, uh, from birth, which you can interpret from the, the baby and that blue period woman, um, to uh, old age, which you can see in the crouching figure in the back. Much, much has been written about the symbolism of the work. Uh, it's interesting what Picasso himself said about La Vie. He said, it isn't I who gave the painting that title. I didn't intend to paint symbols. I simply painted images that arose in front of my eyes. It's for others to find a hidden meaning in them. And I think he might have added, it's for others to find the hidden images beneath the final one. So to, before moving on to the Rose period, to summarize his blue period practice, I like this drawing of his studio. You see palette on the floor, uh, paints on, on the chair, the large kind of composition, a standing figure 
with a, a girl on the easel. Um, so we know that Picasso worked both on cardboard and on canvas, principally in oil, and sometimes covering over earlier compositions. According to Sabertes, he started with white on his palette, and studies have revealed that was lead white for preference. And if one looks at that, its opaque qualities meant that for one thing, it would be better to cover earlier compositions with. If he used ink white, and he did, uh, it's more transparent. So if he wanted to retain some of the elements of a previously painted composition, it'd be easier to do so with zinc white. In general, Picasso used Prussian blue, but he also used ultramarine. And finally, the blue period paintings uh, were not varnished. Now, turning to the change that occurred in Picasso's palette and subject matter, uh, we come to his return to Paris in the spring of 1904, uh, the so-called Rose Period, again, Coquio's term. Uh, Picasso moved that time to a Mont Montmartre studio known as the Bateau Lavoie, which had previously been occupied by a Spanish sculptor whom Picasso knew from his first visit. Um, as early as August of 1904, Picasso met a young artist model who was also living in the same complex of artist studios, and her name was Fernando Olivier, and she became his lover. She kept a journal in which she recorded her first visit to Picasso's studio, and I'll just read you one thing. She said, I went with him to his studio, which is full of large, unfinished canvases. He must work so hard, but what a mess. His paintings are astonishing. I find something morbid in them, which is quite disturbing, but I also quite, I feel quite drawn to them. The furniture in the studio is very meager. There's a wicker chair, some easels, canvases of every size, tubes of paint scattered all over the floor, paint brushes, containers with turpentine, a bath of etching acid. He's working on an acid showing an emaciated man and woman seated at a table in a wine shop who convey an intense feeling of misery and alcoholism with terrifying realism. Now, I might point out that this etching on the left, which is always known as the frugal repast, is the first major etching that Picasso ever did. Uh, it wasn't bad for a first try. Um, he was given the plate by another Spanish artist in Paris, and if you look closely, you can see traces of a landscape in part of it that the other artist scraped off before he gave it to him. Uh, he probably also gave him some instruction on how to work in etching. It was first printed by a very famous printer in Montmartre called Delettre, who had been Toulouse-Lautrec's printer. And uh, Picasso expressed uh, later his dissatisfaction of working with him because Delettre wouldn't let him come into the printing works while the thing was being printed, that is, to make any changes. So we have to consider it as partly uh, the work of Delette, but I do think you'll find it rewarding to look at it as an etching. I mean, the tabletop is done in such a way, the folds of the cloth on the table have a kind of rhythm, um, and the emaciated figures, uh, although they don't look at each other, are drawn together through those kind of attenuated hands, uh, one around the shoulder, the other touching um, her arm of the two figures. Now, Fernand went on to add that from the time they met, Picasso was encouraging her to move in with him. She says that he was constantly doing portraits of her. She said, if I fall asleep, he's beside the bed when I wake up his eyes anxiously fixed on me. And this watercolor on the right shows just that, Picasso watching Fernand sleeping. And I must say, whenever you see Fernand in Picasso's work, in this show, uh, all the way through the Rose period, uh, her features are easily identifiable. Now, if Picasso was asking Fernand to move in with him in August 1904, this suggests at least to me that no other woman was living with him at the time. However, much guesswork has been done about another girlfriend who most likely preceded Fernand in the artist's affections. And the identification of 
the artist model known as Madeleine, provides an example of how later writers have used their, have tried to superimpose their own ideas about what happened in Picasso's life uh, and his art onto this period. Now, this all started very late in the story. The identification of the woman in this portrait as a model and girlfriend of Picasso's, known as Madeleine, only came to light in 1968 when this picture of her was rediscovered. Picasso was in conversation with Pierre Dex, who had just before completed the catalog of the blue, the catalog resume of the blue and rose periods. Picasso told Dex that she had been a girlfriend and she'd become pregnant, but the pregnancy had been aborted. And he said to Dex, imagine me with a child of 64. So Dex, Dex deduced from that that the abortion must have occurred in 1904. Despite what has been written since, there's no evidence that Picasso approved or had any part, had any part in arranging the abortion. In fact, nothing else is known about Madeleine's place in Picasso's life that is based on fact. Dex and subsequently Richardson um, assumed, just on the basis of that identification, that a number of the paintings of 1904-5 were then of Madeleine but there's no other evidence. Apart from this portrait, which Picasso said was Madeleine, is a watercolor which was done around the same time as that one of Picasso watching Fernand, in which the figure of that approaching woman does really resemble, shall I go back, that face. Nonetheless, <laughs> apart from this, and possibly maybe one other. Dex then suggested that quite a few paintings por portray her. It's quite possible that Picasso used her features in subsequent works, but that doesn't confirm that they lived together, that they were still together, nor that she posed for him, uh, which has been assumed. We do know that Madeleine worked for other artists, and portraits of her were said to have been done in 1906 by Bondigliani who painted a girl whom he referred to as Mado, Ami de Picasso. Unfortunately, we can't compare uh, Modigliani's paintings to Picasso, since according to Modigliani expert Alessandro Di Stefano, they were likely destroyed. Nonetheless, a description of her remains in a book that was published in 1929 about Modigliani, saying that this model was blonde, with a beautiful body, and had a marked influence on Modigliani. Even so, both Pierre Dex, who wrote the catalog resume of the Blue and Rose periods, and subsequently John Richardson, have suggested that in 1905, Picasso was still involved with Madeleine because of the work in which they believe her features appear. In my opinion, the others that have been described as Madeleine are generic and could equally be a number of other models. And I thought it'd be fun to look at some of Picasso's models uh, from the time he arrived in Paris going into the early part of 1905. Well, here is the portrait of Madeleine. Picasso said was Madeleine. But here is a beautiful gouache, which is in the show. It's also said to represent Madeleine. I'm not sure which one, because to me, neither of them looks like Madeleine. Uh, this is a work also here, which is thought to be Madeleine, naked. Uh, but is it? Possibly. Um, then there's this painting, which is known to have been the daughter. It's called The Woman with the Crow. Um, she, the model for this was actually a daughter of a cafe owner. Uh, called Frede, well, proprietor, and this is his daughter, Margot. Here's the woman that appeared in the frugal repast. Doesn't look like Madeleine to me. And then there are these 1905 pictures. There's a, a portrait of a woman with a baby. Uh, this is a detail from a painting of 1905, and then this is a little sketch. I draw attention to the detail because Picasso said this was Germaine Gargallo, in 1905, Germaine, the woman Casagemas killed himself for. So Picasso was still friends with her, and she uh, was portrayed in that composition. Her sister, 
who also had lived with Picasso and his friends in 1900, was then the concierge in the Bateau Lavoir. She was posing for Picasso, and she had a baby at the time. And I suspect this is a drawing made from life, that this is probably Antoinette, although the profile and that pouty mouth is unmistakably similar, could be sisters, uh, to uh, Germaine. Now, the fact that she had a baby suggests to me also that Antoinette had a baby in 1904, that maybe these beautiful drawings of mothers with children in 1905 could also have been with her. But what I wanted to point out is that the, the profile, the small mouth, the elongated nose in so many of these is a certain type. So that to say this painting or that painting is a certain person, I think is missing the point with Picasso. One example, which is a lovely one, is this femme en chemise. And it's a painting that is it's in the Tate in London. It's claimed to be a portrait of Madeleine. Uh, but there's another factor that should be considered in the origin of this, and that's the way the composition developed, not as a portrait, but as a quite different subject. Um, and if you look, a visitor to the exhibition here, will be e e it'll be easy to see that around her neck is a roughed collar. It's there. You, he didn't hide it. It's there. And the composition underneath Madeleine by x-ray shows that it wasn't a girl at all. It was a young acrobat boy, quite similar to some of the things in the show. So that you get this young boy's profile, the rough around the collar, his arms here, his, his narrow shoulders. What Picasso, this is an ultraviolet uh, of the painting. What Picasso did was just change slightly Again, that similar profile to the one I showed you in a variety of paintings and prints, uh, elongated the nose, made the mouth a little more uh, pouting, and then piled hair on top of her head, and painted this lovely chemise very loosely over the top, adding a breast, of course. And why it's called Madeleine, I'm not so sure. <laughs> um, now, it's certainly not a portrait in the traditional sense. And she didn't pose for Picasso, nor did many of the people he portrayed pose for him. Uh, and nor do we know for certain that she played any part in the artist's life over the winter of 1945. Now, over that winter, Picasso began to work for, towards another major exhibition, which was scheduled to open at the Gallery Serrurier in February 1905. And just as he had with the Volar show, he embraced the project wholeheartedly, and he worked on numerous paintings as well as a series of prints. Only a few of the works in the, listed in the catalog can be identified with certainty, but the majority of them dealt with the theme of Salton Banks, that is, itinerant troops of acrobats, sometimes, as here in the... Uh, acrobat and young Harlequin in Harlequin's costume. That is that diamond pattern associated with Harlequin. Picasso later said that the idea to focus on the lives of these traveling performers was seeing a group of Salton Banks near the invalided Paris. And it's been suggested that the troupe was performing as part of Christmas festivities. So if, that, if that's the case, this gives us a pretty good idea of when Picasso began to paint and draw these wandering entertainers. The other factor that came into play uh, in the preparations for the Serruri ex exhibition was the predominant use of gouache, which is a kind of opaque watercolor with a binding agent. And he used that as, as his principal medium uh, in works that he prepared for the show, as well as focusing on a lighter, i.e. rose palette. Um, in Acrobat and Young Harlequin, this is an impressive composition, but it's gouache on cardboard. Um, indicating Picasso's renewed desire to work quickly and cheaply in preparation for his show. The shift in palette to rose to tones can be accounted for in part by the colors of the two costumes. 
but overall there's a kind of poetic sens sensibility introduced into the work of this period. And Picasso's friendship with the poet Guillaume Apollinaire certainly contributed to the mood in the Salton Bank compositions. And this mood, I think, was achieved primarily with the materials and colors he had at hand, rather than with traditional symbolism. And it's interesting to see how the colors of the costumes sort of infuse everything around them in the backgrounds. Now, one of the prints that was probably in the Saruri ex exhibition is this one, which is a family of Salton Banks. And I show it to you as a kind of, not only a lovely print, but a group composition in which he shows all the different types of figures that would be seen in rehearsal, that is off stage, a troop of entertainers, uh, a woman holding her baby, a pregnant woman with a small child carrying wood, a girl practicing on a ball, and there's an acrobat with Harlequin's hat uh, watching. Um, the, this, this is kind of what I think is at the heart of the Salton Bank subject. But moving from one medium, such as printmaking, to another, gouaches uh, or oils or drawings, um, often Picasso singled out, rather than doing the whole group, single figures such as this girl balancing on the ball. And this is a work that's in Russia. Um, and it's notable for a variety of reasons. Uh, not only for this kind of contrast of the massive figure who's sitting on a block uh, which echoes the shape of his back and this lithe uh, young girl on the ball. You can see some of those other figures from the print, like the woman holding a baby with a child in the background. Um, in this case, Picasso, and here's another photograph from 1901, Picasso took this painting which is a portrait of his friend, another artist called Itorino, who, and that portrait was exhibited in his Volar exhibition. What he did with this, this canvas was he actually painted over what was on the back, or maybe someone else did, but Picasso turned it over and painted this. So this is different from recycling the blue period compositions. This is reusing the, the canvas in a different way. Uh, here's Picasso on the left, um, Magnac in the center, and another Spanish artist on the right. Um, so um, the other thing I wanted to say about this work, and so many of the works of the Rose period, is that his use, this is oil on canvas, that's the canvas, his use of oil here almost mimics gouache. That's it. It's painted very thinly. I remember when I first saw this painting in Russia, I couldn't believe how thin it looked. Uh, and I think it's because the impact of working in gouache, uh, a, a type of watercolor, uh, starts to infuse the way he approached his oils. Now, this work, which is a key work of the show here, but also it was a key work in the Serrurier exhibition, was this family of Salton Banks with an ape, which is in Gothenburg in Sweden. And it was also done primarily with gouache. There's, there are editions of watercolor and Indian ink on cardboard. And like a number of other compositions, it focuses on the lives of the Salton Banks offstage with the performing animal being part of the family. Uh, notice how it's almost part of the family as much through the gestures of its, ha its hands and feet, which are so human-like, and the gestures of the principal figures. Um, now, one of the first online reviews of the Bioler exhibition uh, drew attention to this particular composition. But what they said about it really got me. They suggested that this painting on the left was about Picasso's girlfriend, that is, Madeleine, who, and that it was the artist whose guilt he felt about her abortion, there's no fact, there's no evidence of this, uh, inspired the subject of a mother with a child. So we're back to guesswork about Madeleine. I mean, if Picasso had a model for that figure at all with that face, it would have been Antoinette, who I show you another sketch made from life, the concierge at the Bateau Loire with her baby. Um, one thing I wanted to say about 
something when you look at the works in the show, is that it isn't always the first things, that is the things underneath that fascinated Picasso. It's the last marks on a painting that I find fascinating as well. And in this one, the way in which he articulates, for example, her face, her hair, and draws attention just to certain aspects of it is typical of the way he worked at this period and later. So I'd like to end with, oops, what happened? Did I do that? Here we are. I'd like to end with two images of Picasso, one blue, one rose, one identifying with what I've hoped to set out are some of the features of the blue period, the other of the rose. On the left is the so-called blue self-portrait of 1901. His friend Sabartes wrote, Picasso believes that art emanates from sadness and pain. With this we agree. That sadness lends itself to meditation and that grief is at the wellsprings of life. And one might add, at the blue period, it's this sadness and grief uh, that is at the well of, wellspring of his art. In the family of Saltenbanks, a painting, again, that doesn't travel, but in the Washington National Gallery, gallery the Picasso assumes the role of Harlequin, uh, the acrobat, in, the, in this family scene. And I thought I might read you what Apollinaire wrote about Picasso's Saltenbanks in 1905. He said, the Harlequins go in splendid rags while the painting is gathering, warming, or whitening its colors to express the strength and duration of the passions. The color has the flatness of frescoes, but the lines are firm. In this way, I think, Picasso transforms their world into his own realm in the Rose period. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, I'd be happy to. To answer. Marilyn. It doesn't really seem so. Actually, Marilyn, I had a question. You mentioned you made this series of comparisons of these different um, female models um, at a certain point. Um, there was also Alice, uh, the, yes. the later Alice Durand, I yeah. think. And she has became, a very similar profile. Who also looks actually I had like that, Madeleine. I had that as one of my <laughs> examples to add to my little cast. Yeah. And so, didn't put it in, but there were others as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it has to be said that occasionally Picasso did work with models. There are portraits. There was a portrait of a singer in the 1905 show. But that more often than not, he painted people that he knew or saw, and they didn't need to pose for him. Mm. But yes, Alice Durand is another. Um, there's a lovely painting of a woman called Gabby in the Guggenheim Museum of this period. She, I think, probably posed. It seems a portrait. You have that wonderful portrait of Benedetta Canals uh, in the show, but her features are very different. Mm. And she, of course, was Italian, not a kind of French generic type. In fact, also, um, when uh, Picasso's son came to the Fondation Claude Picasso, he mentioned that he remembers, for instance, also when he painted his son himself, he never actually, he never had to pose for his father, for instance, neither his sister. So for him, it was clear that Picasso actually he never absorbed. used a model. But I think that was different in the early period. Well, I don't know if it was all that different. Yeah. I mean, there's a wonderful story in Francois Gillot's Life with Picasso book, which um, talks about moving in with Picasso in the 1940s when she first went to live with him. And she said when she first moved in, he told her to take off all her clothes and spend the day naked in the studio. And at the end of the day, he said to her, OK, that's enough. I, you never have to pose for me mm -hmm. again. <laughs> because he had absorbed not only her face, but her body as well. And mm -hmm. it's true. That, I mean, you can always recognize when he's making reference to her. Yeah. So I think he had that from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Are there yeah. other? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, excuse me, um, before the, the two first pictures you, you showed, 
um, I wasn't quite sure if um, at the um, at the Moulin Rouge or the, even the ones before um, were there paintings by the original uh, artist or what? Uh, from for example, uh, there was one which seemed to me um, uh, the first one. Uh, the first one was it from Picasso or was it from Lautrec? The well, I showed both. One. Yeah, the, both. let me see. Okay, that's Picasso. Yeah, that's a photograph. And that's low track. Ah, that's low track. Okay. That's low track. Okay. So what I'm what I'm suggesting is that when Picasso went to Paris, he wanted to identify with French painting, not only in terms of subject matter, but also in terms of the way in which he conveyed the subject through the composition. Uh, it's interesting that this painting, which is a large painting, and he did it on that first trip, was actually sold on that trip. So uh, it was recognized at the time as having, you know, for a 19-year-old, having great potential. But this is definitely Toulouse-Lautrec done a few years before. And there's a wonderful painting, for example, by Van Gogh, which I didn't bring, but it shows a village dance, which also has similarities. So I think Picasso was trying to identify through his work with the painters that he considered kind of the mainstream of French art and those that he admired the most. Is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? I don't think so. Okay. Thank you very much, You're Marilyn, for this wonderful conference, which gave us a new and uh, very complete insight into the blue. And Will you change periods. some of your labels now? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. You gave us a lot of advice, actually. So I, I hope we did the right job. Yeah. Thank you very much okay. again, Marilyn. And thank you. Uh, thank you for coming thank you. and have a nice evening. Thank you.